as we celebrate Advent, we begin by acknowledging that we are not of this world, that our souls are immortal, and we are made not for this life, but for eternal life. And this truth doesn't come natural. We don't immediately notice that or are aware of it. It's only by a revelation of love that we can experience a revolution of our life, beginning by how we think, to be renewed, to be transformed in our hearts by the renewal of our minds. And God, in unveiling his heart to us, unveiling his life to us, revealing his face to us, shows us the full reality of what makes life so, so beautiful. And that ultimate reality of the beauty of life is him. And we're made for him. He is all. He alone is all and everything that makes life worth living and utterly beautiful. And it's for this beauty of the fullness of life, which is love, that for which we are made. And that, this, the discovery of that beauty ignites fire in our soul. And it's only God who can ignite that. It's only God who can enkindle that fire because that fire is, it's a supernatural flame. It doesn't come from the flesh. It's not a flame of the flesh, of the earthly passions. It's a heavenly fire. And it's God's desire for us. God who desires us to be one with him through Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate fire of God's heart. God is a consuming fire of a life of love that is eternal. And he so loved the world that he made us for this life. But because humanity had made such a mess of God's gift of creation, the Lord needed to send his son for our redemption, to allow grace to become greater than the mess that we cause in creation. And so it's only this fire of love that purifies us from the brokenness that comes from the mess that mess that begins with disobedience whenever we say no to God's invitation of love. Whenever we say no to God's revelation of truth. Whenever we try to exchange what God offers for some human invention or exchange God's wisdom for human understanding, God's will for our own human pursuit. Whenever we do that, whenever we break this covenant with God, whenever we break covenant with God, communion with God, the sacredness of a, a right relationship with God, the breaking of this covenant through his commandments, breaking his commandments, always means the breaking of our lives. And the only thing that can, break, that can bring our broken lives back together again, the only thing that can heal us, is love. And the healing, the healing expression of love is most best expressed in sacred scripture as fire. That's, what fi that's one of the properties of fire is that it heals purifies, heals, it restores, it can forge two different metals into one. And so this transformative property of fire, 
which has the cap capacity to transform into itself whatever it burns, God desires to transform us into, its, into himself. That we may be one. As the Father is one with the Son. And what is that union of the Father and the Son but the Holy Spirit? The union of love of the Father and the Son is, the, is the, living, the living flame of that love that unites them as one is the Spirit. And so the flame of love that flows incandescently like a fountain from the purity of Mary's beauty, from the purity of Mary's love for the Trinity, from the pure beauty of her love her union with the Father as the most perfect daughter of the Father ever, the new Eve. The pure beauty of her perfect love with the Son as the mother of the Savior, who contained in her womb him whom the whole cosmos could not contain, namely its creator. The pure beauty of her communion with the Spirit of the living God as her own spouse. That fire of God, refulgent in this woman, is what has, is, is the way by which God desires to bring about his ultimate revolution in the world. The revolution of Christ and his gospel through the purity of Mary. One of the great, the greatest story, this, in saying the greatest is subjective, it's in many ways just a matter of personal preference, but one of the, at least one of the most popular stories among the desert fathers, who are those valiant, heroic men of the fourth century, who were not no longer able to give their lives to Christ in martyrdom. And so after the legalization of Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire and the, and the Western world. Martyrdom was no longer a possibility. And yet these men were ignited by this fire of desire to give their souls completely to Jesus Christ in total sacrifice, that they wanted to embrace the cross as much as they could in the best way possible. And so they went out into the desert to, to live an ascetical life of prayer and sacrifice. And they grew in the life of grace in a profound way that made them sages of the spiritual life, beacons of luminaries of God's light, God's word and his wisdom. And among these stories of the Desert Fathers, the, one of the most popular and my favorite is Abba Joseph. And I've shared this story with many of you, many people before, and many of you have probably heard me share it in the past. One of the novices comes to Abba Joseph and he says, look, I'm, I'm doing all of my duties. I'm fulfilling all of the rules. I'm doing A, B, C, D. I pray in the morning, the afternoon, in the evening. I fast on you know, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I offer this, I do that, yada, yada, yada. He, he checked all the boxes on his list. And he's like, I still feel like something's missing. Something's still missing. So he's going to Abba Joseph to say, I still feel like, now I'm, I'm paraphrasing, there's still, I still feel this hole in my soul. There's still something missing. And his answer is, if you will, you can become all flame. And some translations say you can become totally transformed into fire. A similar story is heard by a more contemporary saint from Russia, one of the favorite saints of Pope St. John Paul II, Seraphim of Seraph, who lived so well, lived up to his name. 
of the seraphim. The angels were most close to the heart of God and are filled with the fire of God's life. And Saint Seraphim of Russia, who was a contemporary of Saint Therese, lived in the, 19, the end, the latter part of the 19th century. A similar story is accounted that one of his novices, which is like someone studying under him, a student learning from the teacher, came up to him and said the same thing. But according to the standards of that day and age in terms of what do I need to do to be holy? He checked off all of his lists says there's still something lacking in me. And his response was similar to Abba Joseph's in the 4th century. However, with St. Seraphim, if I remember the story correctly, he just gazed up towards heaven with his hands in the air of ador- in, this, in the Oron's position of adoration, and his fingers began to become each little torches, little flames of fire. And he became transfigured. And the light, the, t- the, the Taboric light, the light that trans- of which Jesus was transfigured on Mount Tabor, completely transfigured his countenance. And he said something to the effect of Abba Joseph, if you will, you can become also fire. Our friend John Sullivan by the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit's anointing upon him, so well communicated to us about the essence of the flame of love of the Immaculate Heart of Mary as not simply being another devotion, not simply being another movement, not simply being for this group uh, of folks that meet at such and such an hour uh, and do these X, Y, Z, this list of prayers and sacrifices during the week and follow this routine. It's not even simply for the however many Catholics is estimated to be in in the world. But all of humanity falls under this longing gaze of God to draw all to his sacred heart. And to do so through the immaculate heart of her who most burned with love for God, who was most full of grace. The only one full of grace, as full of grace, as close to full of grace as was Jesus himself. And one of the important points in addition to that that John shared with us is that it's, it's one thing to say the flame of love prayers and our Blessed Mother doesn't ask for much, But it's important not to lose the forest for the trees, to not focus so much on the external, the externals of the devotion or the the observances of how to live a life of sacrifice and not to lose the heart and soul of the way of life that it calls us to, namely the inner life of Jesus and Mary. And he referred often to how much the spirituality of the flame of love echoes karma. It communicates the essence of the Carmelite saints, their spirituality and wisdom in terms of being called to being totally transformed into love and to become love as God is love in the world one little act of love at a time. And as John pointed out, and he so well communicated without referencing Therese directly, the little way of Therese in terms of the kind of sacrifices that were called to become creative in making, to become dynamically disposed to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and what it means to creatively live in God's presence, aware in whose presence we are and in in whom we live, move, and have our being. And when we live more fully in this active friendship of God's living presence as the very air that we breathe, abiding in him, with him, and through him, 
then we become more aware. The big buzzword outside of the Catholic Church that comes from Buddhism but is pretty popular with people of all walks of life is mindfulness. Being mindful of what matters most. Becoming aware, or St. Teresa used to word, use the word recollection. The unity prayer says living in harmony with God, our souls being in harmony with, with the soul of Christ. It's when we're living with that kind of conscious awareness that we can become dynamically disposed to the creative inspiration of the moment and what it means to choose love, to live love. And then that, can be, that becomes gradually more and more as we become purified by the flame of love. As St. John of the Cross, the great Carmelite do mystical doctor talks about, as we become gradually more and more purified by the living flame of God's love and what it means to love in God's image and likeness, what it means to love not simply on the natural level, which is so stuck in self-will, disordered self-love and self-importance, where we become purified from that kind of love and learn to love more in accord and in harmony with the heart of God, revealed in Christ crucified, then we can become more and more free to discover our identity, to become love as God is love. And that's our vocation. As St. Therese so well said, my vocation is love. To be love in the heart of the church, which means in the heart of the church, she was referencing the heart and the body is hidden, it's unseen. It's not the hands, it's not the feast, feet, it's not the face. It's a hidden presence of love in the world. And it's that love of the heart, figuratively speaking, but the beating of that heart that communicates, that extends, or that keeps the blood flowing through the rest of the body. And it's that hidden activity of the heart beating with love that gives life to the rest of the body. So we're called to the hidden life of love above all else because that's where the miracles take place. The hidden life of love through prayer and sacrifice is what allows God to be God and to do what God does best which is convert us into his image and likeness, unite us to himself. And when, we, when we're united to him, like St. John of the Cross talks about, in the beginning, that requires the purification of all kinds of selfish inclinations and defects of temperament. And it purifies us of that. And the more closer we get to the heart of God, the calmer becomes the fire. The more beautiful and smooth and soothing and warming and transforming becomes the fire. So we become totally one with the fire. Or we become totally love, as God is love, deified in the life of God himself. This is why Mary is such a huge instrument of God, the author of miracles. Because from the very beginning of her conception, she was all fire. She was full of grace. There was no defect in her. Nothing that could hinder the action of God. Nothing that inhibited the life of the Spirit. She, from the very beginning, was this fountain of goodness, beauty, truth, life of God. And it's when we grow in this life of grace, through her help, who obtains for us far more than we could ever do for ourselves, it's the more that we do that we can begin to forget ourselves, forget our, our little lists, 
forget our attachment to results, forget our clinginess to want to control outcomes, to want to see the results and the, and the, and the evidence, we begin to be free the more we forget ourselves and are just more and more aflame with the life of love. And that's when the miracles really begin. The more it's less of me and more of him. And that's what God wants. And that is what most glorifies him. And that's what saves souls. As we celebrate this Eucharist, we celebrate this action of God, this redemption of God as the all-consuming fire. And we receive this fire, the very being of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit into our body. That we may be consumed by what we consume. That we may be totally converted into that with which we eat. Love. The sacrament of life in God, which is love. As we receive this flame of love through the Holy Eucharist, the heart of Jesus, we, re we ask Mary to prepare us with her dispositions, which we see so well communicated through St. Therese, the dispositions of humble gratitude and audacious confidence in God. That we may walk in the light of the Lord, as Isaiah said in the first reading, the way of freedom and confidence. And thus be Mary's ambassadors. Ambassadors of her beauty. The way of the flame that consumes her soul. And that, that what's in her may also be in us. As John so well said, for those in your family who you love so much, especially maybe your children or grandchildren, especially those who don't even know the Lord, but are such good people that you work, that you know at work, as including those who are most in need of God's mercy, who are furthest away from them, that we can begin to love them as God loves them, with the flame of his love ignited in our souls. And just like those people whom God ignites a desire that they may know the Lord, and how much we would love to be able to take what God has put in us, due to no merit of our own, but a mystery of his will, to take what he has given us as pure grace, a sheer gift, and as if we could, would that we could just be able to just put our hand on their head, and just like that, they would get it. Get the flame. Would that it would be that easy. Our Blessed Mother wants to put the flame that's in her heart in ours. As we receive this flame, may we magnify the Lord and, and live already in the triumph of the Immaculate Heart.